Hello everyone and welcome to this Whole School SEND webinar. I'm Rachel Hargreaves and I'm the Regional SEND Lead for the North. Um, with us today leading this um, webinar for us is Denise Atkinson from the Education Psychology Service. So we're very, very pleased that you've joined us, Denise, and um, are leading our webinar this evening. We've also got Francesca and Mia who are joining us from the whole school SEND team to provide any technical support. So if there are any um, technical issues with your Zoom, then um, please let them know using the chat function. If you haven't attended one of our Zoom webinars before, there are a few ways that you can communicate with us. So I'm gonna um, just talk you through the um, the Zoom screen so that you can hopefully get it set to work for you. So if there are any specific questions for Denise during the webinar, you can submit them through the Q&A box below. So along your bottom screen, there'll be a Q&A icon. Um, so please feel free to, to pop any questions in there. And um, we're hoping that there'll be time at the end for a, a Q&A session and that we'll go through the question and answers in that section. We've over um, or almost 200 attendees signed up um, to the webinar today so um, hopefully there'll be quite a few um, good questions that'll come from this and Denise will try and answer most of them live but if if she doesn't get a chance to then we'll collate all of those and send a response out after the event. There's also a chat function at the bottom and I can see some people have found that already, which is brilliant. You know, please feel free to use that to introduce yourselves and network as well um, with other people in the webinar. We know we've got people from all over, all over the country and, and it's, it's great to have so many people here. Um, please make sure though that the chat function is set to all um, panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments. We will be sharing the presentations with you on screen today. So if you feel that the presentation's too small for you to view, if you go to the top of your screen and select view options, you can change your zoom ratio to 150% to make that bigger for you. And we also recommend that you watch the presentation in speaker view with the chat open on side by side mode so that you can see both sets of screens. After the webinar finishes, you will receive a follow-up survey where you can give us some feedback on the event itself. And we'd really appreciate you um, taking the time to fill this in so we can see how to improve the events and what to host for you in the future. You will be getting a copy of all the presentation slides and the materials as well. So they will come to you in a follow-up email. So please um, don't worry about having to make too many notes. So thank you for joining. Let's get started. Thank you, Denise. I'm going to hand straight over to you. Thanks, Rachel. Well, great. I can't see you all, which is quite surreal, but um, thank you for coming along and showing an interest in this topic. I do think it's got more and more relevance today in schools um, with teaching and learning. And so it's good that it's become increasingly important. So um, I'll, I'll give you a, a move forward to just say that a lot of my work is going to be based on these authors and researchers. Um, they've become increasingly um, popular and informed in the area of working memory. And um, actually, you'll have some links at the end that I refer to. And I, I'm referring to the book that I've actually ended up purchasing, which I've listed at the end, which is a really useful resource for teaching and learning in the classroom. So great that you've come and we'll get on with what we're going to cover today. So we're looking briefly at what working memory is because I years ago before I started looking more into this topic as an area of interest and obviously thinking about it as a teacher before that really didn't have a full understanding of what working memory consisted of and it's actually a little bit more complicated than I thought in terms of the components so we're going to look at that albeit more briefly than the strategies and the support because I agree that's that's why you'll be here today um, we're talking about why it's important we're talking about low working memory, but what that looks like. So the indicators, the hallmarks for that. 
Um, and some of that you'll recognize from seeing it in certain students and certain students will come to mind in this presentation and you'll have probably case studies that you, you might go back to um, to do more research and follow ups, which is great. So we'll think about low working memory, but then I would say at least half of the PowerPoint today is going to be on strategies. It's going to be on what will help in the classroom, what will help the child in their approach, what will help with um, the environment and how you teach and how much you teach and how much content you provide. So we'll, I'll move forward into that. So what is working memory? Well, this is one of the definitions. It's a broad generic definition, um, but actually when you look at it in more detail, it's describing holding information in mind and that process of holding something in mind and I'm going to be looking across at notes, by the way, because I've expanded on some of these in notes at the side. So I haven't got a squint or a strange turn in my eye. So really, when you're holding in mind, it's, it's a very difficult process because you might be interrupted, distracted, there might be noise. And so managing to do that and manipulate information is very difficult for working memory. So it involves that holding, manipulating, and it's also described as a sort of mental workspace in some ways. You can almost imagine it as a great big jotting pad that we have where we bring in prior information, um, current information, and we do something with it to manipulate it and process it to make it come up with an outcome, to make it apply it to a task. Um, and so we're talking about a mental juggling really in many ways. I love the expression of juggling because you're keeping several balls up in the air which may involve skills, knowledge, concepts and they all have to be thrown together and somehow come back down in some sort of a sequence, some sort of a process. So I really like that analogy. So that when you're asking children to remember something, to do something as part of a task, there will be several balls up in the air and one of those might be snatched by someone around them um, just simply by moving or asking a question um, or somebody coming in and knocking at the door. So it can, it's such a fine balance. It's such a, a complex task. That is part of working memory and I've, I've mentioned holding in mind, but it's in the face of distraction and I'll come on to that later, but the loss of working memory is very fragile. And actually what we're talking about is trying to keep it simple and reduced in terms of content and skills so that children in this case in education can concentrate, can manage that challenge. So what you can imagine is for the children that are, are less attentive um, and even referring to the ADHD subtype or ASD, you can imagine the challenge that they face. Um, with remembering and manipulating information in the, in the face of that distraction, distraction and ignoring it. So it's about encouraging that ignoring, encouraging the focusing as much as encouraging um, the memory processes. So we've got a challenge on our hands with that. I've put a couple of tasks up here to give you an idea of what sort of challenges or tasks would incorporate working memory. I'm pretty good at remembering numbers. I chunk them. So I've already got an, a memory aid or some sort of rehearsal strategies. I can remember numbers in a weird way, lots of numbers, but a lot of people don't know their mobile telephone number if you ask them. And that happened, seemed to happen for years when people first got mobiles. So it's a skill and you can either apply a strategy or um, you have to write it down or you, know, you have to have it somewhere else to refer to, but certainly directions. Now that is the one that challenges me, but if you're told one or two directions, the beginning, you might remember that. And then the, the middle part seems hazy. And especially if you're focusing on, someone, on something that someone is telling you and you actually end up focusing on the person that you've asked and all of a sudden you've lost the rest of it. Um, or you're quite stressed when you're looking for the directions and the radio's on. So you find, I don't know if you find that you have to turn the radio off, you have to get rid of those distractions and you have to really be able to home in on and repeat um, the beginning at the end, the middle and put it all together. So directions is another one. In terms of, I wanted to put a task in there 
for you know you're asking children to do multi-step follow multi-step instructions every day um, and for all we think we deliver simple instructions actually just saying okay you've got to do this then you've got to put your book away then you need this then you've got to get that and then you've got to come and sit down there are actually four or five things there in that in, in that set of instructions that you probably interpret as a, a longer instruction, but is actually quite detailed. And so you've probably lost the children at, at put your book in your tray, for example. Um, so it, it really is difficult and needs to be a, a mindful, conscious process that you're adjusting and changing your approach and your, your style when it comes to instructions as well. I put in a long multiplication because again if you think about the stages that's involved the numbers where they go to the different parts of that sum it's a multi-step problem if you're holding in mind concepts numbers information so for looking at the components of working memory it's it's set into three essential items and I've put into the center. Can you, can you see the central executive? I decided to put that in red last night and to rise it above because they call it the master of the systems and the other two um, vi visual, sp spatial and verbal. They're the slaves in many ways. The central is the control mechanism a bit like the Star, Star Trek Enterprise in that they're getting, they're bringing them together and it, the underpinning factor is the attention. There needs to be attention, there needs to be coordination. And so what I, they're actually saying is that the central executive system is vital, attention is vital, and that is overseeing this complex process. And can you see all of the steps that it's doing, the coordinating, the processing, um, the, the carrying on attending in the face of distraction and it's across the front part of that brain both left and right whereas you'll notice if we move to visual spatial it's a short-term memory it's mainly focused on your images your pictures um, but crucial in terms of being able to recall those because some people really do key into those those images and they're very important to them in terms of remembering information so that you do need your photographs you do need some symbols because it helps internalize that information but it's very much right brain right hemisphere um, and so balance that the visual spatial is what i would say with your tasks always with your verbal because you'll often find that children will get overloaded with language and simply not be able to process the language, the amount of language that you're giving them. And I always do this, but I always provide too much language, whereas actually a photograph can provide a hundred words in many ways. And it's something that they will still focus on and remember long after. So if we look at the verbal, it is basically looking at numbers and words, letters, um, it might be key headings. Again, it's the short term, but it's the left. So what you're saying is how do these work in coordination well it's the central executive that coordinates between the two they're separate but they can be linked and for all the information is very different and stored and processed differently it there are essential and crucial links between them i would normally say talk among yourselves as to what the problem could be with that but i think you'll know the problem of losing attention and i think you'll know the problem of people of children not processing the language or having too much language there um, or not something to refer to with a visual spatial. I think we do a really good job of that in education now, to be fair. And I'll talk about that with learning styles of thinking all the time. How can we make this more visual? How can we make this more practical and kinesthetic so that the information sticks? Right. But what I would say about the components that's very important is how have they got to this information? I don't think they particularly had this 10 years ago. And even the model I'm referring to late, uh, later, it's, it was updated from 74 to 2000. I think it's been looking at brain imagery and the parts of the brain that are working with um, cognitive tasks that people are given. So it's actually showing up on your ECGs and, and sort of a brain mapping exercise that could be color coded for your right and your left. Um, also, what's happened is that when people have had brain injury, 
particularly uh, road traffic accidents or some sort of a, an embolism, that some parts of the brain, particularly with language, will stop working as well. And so there are other areas of the brain, which is amazing really in terms of how that can function and compensate, it will end up working and helping with remembering and um, for all there is damage. And that's particularly happened with language um, and the research that's been done. What I'd also refer to is that there's a short term component of both visual and verbal. And so actually it's referring to the long term aspect is more memory of experiences. It's looking at episodic, semantic, but that's going right back to the, the back of their, their store and thinking about the experiences and, and lots of essential elements that came with that. So sights, sounds, smells, something that might have been very emotional, um, music, but it's a, it's a much more complex process. And this is more referring to working memory as the short term. Okay. I talked about the model. I referred to Badley um, model, which around came around in 1974, but was updated, as I said. And if you can see, the central executive is a major part of that, but they've also got the phonological loop, which was part of the short-term verbal memory. And it's saying that with, with language, um, the information is kind of processed on a loop in many ways, and it becomes round again and is digested, processed, perhaps summarised in some ways, perhaps simplified, but that is a very important part of that model and, and memory. And the visuospatial is put into some sort of a context of images, um, other images that relate or reply, a much bigger picture. But again, it becomes a, a, a wider sketch pad in some ways. So if you want more explanation of that, I decided not to put in, which is what I normally do with presentations, the longer, the shortest one I could find was five minutes, but I have put that in as a link both on the slide and at the end, I believe. And so you could have a look at that because it's a lovely way of explaining it. And it might be something useful to do with children in terms of thinking about styles of learning for the older children anyway, and for you to understand it a little bit more. So I'll not go into too much more detail with that, but it is the key model that is referred to and explains the processes. I talked about the executive functions, um, the coordination of your memory, the strategies that of switching between visual, spatial and uh, verbal and the links that between that. It's very much about a flexibility. It's about trying to develop some strategies that link both, both with your teaching and your learning and your remembering. So perhaps getting children to do mind maps, for example, that would allow them to draw and recall um, charts, diagrams, things that bring up both in terms of the drawing and, and the writing of information. And then I'll talk about the in inhibition and, and it's also about control. And so I've had to mention this here because in many ways, if you're talking about a child that has attention issues, they're not very good at controlling and ignoring, in the face of distraction, the outside environment, um, people, noises, the setting. And so it's actually about trying to improve that control, that self-control, in, in quite a mindful way, really, as part of your teaching. And to it, to some degree do it with your environment but also to be aware of the distractions and to bring the children back. That's why I think that brain gym has become increasingly important. It's almost about preparing the child, children as learners and getting them to do exercises, getting them to be in the moment, getting them to relax, um, get their body ready and um, prepare themselves as learners um, with some key actions, some key phrases. So because they go, if they want to hold and manipulate information longer term, they're going to have to have that self-control. And it could be about actually stopping the lesson if it's become too noisy, too distracted and getting the attention back. I noticed that there's a lot of people moving. There's a lot of movement. Should we just stop and bring it back to where we were? And I don't think we do that enough. We plow on. I've seen so many lessons. Educational psychologists gives you the luxury of sitting at the back where the teachers plow on and they become louder and their language actually becomes faster because they're stressed. And um, the content seems to tumble out in more of a flustered way. I do understand that stress element, but actually the children, are, are, you're losing them. So bring it back, encourage them, teach them 
how do they, how do you ignore distractions and help them do that? And I'm sure you'd get more learning, more recall. Okay, I thought it was useful to explain, to, to explain more about development. It, there's lots of facts here that I didn't realize. Um, what I would say is that there's um, quite a significant leap or jump, you could say, for all it seems gradual from year to year and not very apparent um, between the five, the key stage one and the key stage two. Um, small but significant increases by the time children are 15. Um, um, but actually what you're saying is that children are learning more and are manipulating more information. And actually as they become more fluent, for example, have more vocabulary, and become more operational with maths processes and everything, the knowledge becomes more refined, that's allowing them to manipulate more information. So it actually jogs, the working memory jogs along alongside the maturity of the brain and um, processes that go with that, but they also, also learn more. So it, it, it is supposed to complement them. Unfortunately, it is a relative and fixed capacity. And so what you would find is that if there was low working memory problems in key stage one, that would affect children as early as um, six, seven, and be very evident in assessment. And, and that would continue with them. It's not to say we can't make some changes, we couldn't help them on their way, but and, and it's that grim. But I would say that you will start to see these difficulties as early as key stage one, and we'll need to make changes to teaching and learning um, and compensation on compensatory strategies. Um, not put it down to an immaturity. Do think that we need to do something about this and be proactive. In terms of um, an optimum capacity, we're saying that actually it's declining from 50 to 60. So, and, and that's why they're encouraging people to stay active with mental stimulation, um, particularly crosswords they're saying, processes that encourage more recall um, and stimulate the brain. But it is developing from 15 and still up to 30. So that capacity is still there, which is really good for lifelong learners. If you think we're still studying, um, we're not finished studying really. If you go to master's PhD level until well on into your 30s um, and, to not, and to keep studying really, to keep learning and, and challenging your brain as much as you can. What I would say in terms of development is there still are personal limits to what people can achieve. So you might teach them strategies, expect them to know this, but actually everyone has their limits and those limits do need to be respected. And um, you need to take into account those limits when you're planning your teaching and learning and have certain children in mind in terms of what you could reasonably expect for them. And that's why I'll come to outcomes later is what, what that, those should look like because I think we need to build a careful profile, but also have the right outcomes for particular children that are struggling with working memory. Um, what I would say is that actually, over time, we do become more efficient. We can fine tune our strategies and our processes so that there, there is work, there is optimism in terms of developing that. Um, I wanted to point out the difference between boys and girls. It didn't feel such a huge difference. But what I would say is if you think about the attentional dif differences of boys, um, that can be apparent. Uh, they need more movement to some degree. Um, for some boys, not all boys, um, they need things to be quite kinesthetic and quite practical, respond quite well to the visuospatial element. Um, and the images, they, as much as the processing of language, their language, sometimes the development is not as good in key stage one. Um, and so you've got these key differences that do make a difference to the teaching and the learning as well. But yes, boys' memory, working memory is, is not as um, well developed in some cases, but three to two does not feel such a huge difference. But that was in the lowest 10%. I mean, that's a, a crucial statistic as well. Is there anything I've missed in terms of development? I would say it's a steady development. I would say it's largely consistent. And I would say again that there's personal limits. There was a really interesting study that I wanted to mention here, and it was the study with um, key stage one children. 
and they measured their um, gather coal did a, a study quite a large study and she looked at working memory of these six to seven year olds and she said that actually um, the ones that had not reached their milestones had low working memory difficulties and that was apparent with those assessments and particularly those with the subtype of ADHD. Now that doesn't feel like rocket science and I, I, I know you can that all makes sense to you but actually what it's saying is we should really be tracking those children and we should really be doing as much as we can for them in key stage one as opposed to putting it down to an immaturity we should be targeting that we should be coming up with more on the memory and intervention and support side more support plans really and don't be surprised that it could be as, as many as 10 percent of those children in your class that have those working memory difficulties so that we have to adjust our teaching and we have to be putting in more planning around those children from that early stage. Now, the problem is that if you're getting you're talking about education healthcare plans, they're sometimes not coming in into uh, implemented until key stage two. So perhaps it is about earlier referrals for those children and more key assessment. And I think I do think in schools they're asking for more assessment quite early on. And certainly if they were going through CAMS, they would have that clinical psychology, that cognitive assessment would take place as part of your ADHD and a part of your ASD assessment, because it is still part of that key picture. Is this a behaviour difficulty or is this actually part of a learning difficulty? as well and it's part of that flowchart you need to be able to understand what the variables are okay loss of working memory how does how do we lose information i feel like i can lose information very easily just going up the stairs now but of course i'm in that 50 to 60 bracket so i maybe have reason for for fear but um i think it's all about distraction not just decay i would say that actually that we can be very easily distracted and not realize how easy that is and especially if you've got sensory needs if you think about it you become quite overloaded by noise um or by textures or, or by something in the environment that's moving ever so slightly that's bothering you. So there's many, many distractions that can work against memory. It's one of those barriers that I'll talk about. But actually, if you're trying to hold a lot of information, it feels almost impossible. And I would say that's the time when you zone out. And actually, a low work memory working difficulty is part of that, that these children that are challenged will zone out and, and the shutters will come down you almost think the lights have gone out we've lost them because they're moving around and and they're not managing and it's not necessarily a behavioral issue it's actually we've stopped being able to process this and take this in and i can't hold much more so it's that hands up time out from the brain's perspective um losing information is is partly because you're doing something else at the same time now i think this is particularly pertinent in this day and age because if you think about someone, a teenager, and them walking around with their phone, for example, and perhaps have just sent a text that could be quite an emotive text to a friend or a girlfriend, boyfriend, and, and that's going to resonate with them and carry with them, but they're expected to do something else. Well, I'm really of the mind that the should, phone should be banned in school um, or not definitely not in lessons. Um, but I think even as teachers, we're teaching from the computer. We might have a problem with the whiteboard. We've got a, a difficult email come through that we need to get back to and we're running low on time and all of a sudden it affects our our delivery and uh, remember the balls I was referring to there's just too many of those balls up in the air and a big ones come along and swiped all the smaller ones out and we've lost that the equilibrium we've lost uh, the dynamics so try not to be doing something at the same time or expect the children to be doing something at the same time and um, also, if you're talking about remembering a sequence, the location is very, very important because actually what we're finding with working memory is that people remember the beginning and the ending, but we're not remembering the middle, remembering the middle. And again, it's just too much information. So it's about where you put key information. Are you going to put that at the beginning? Do you need a sandwich of information around it or do you just need to get to the key items or come back to that with key headings, key words? and repeat and summarize. 
What I would say about the loss is it's about the environment. It's about the stress levels and keeping those as low as you can. So what are some of the barriers? Well, it's not just as simple as remembering. Um, it's also about the language that you're using. If you're using large words, which I have to be careful of in my role, um, there's quite a lot of jargon. There's quite a lot of acronyms that we take for granted, particularly in education when we're talking to professionals and especially with parents. But with students, we really can't can't overestimate their vocabulary. If you're talking about children, there's a huge range of vocabulary in one classroom with a, a group of children. So I think it's always about summarizing a lot of vocabulary and putting more complicated words on the board and defining those and having your word banks, access, ask, access to those on the desk, access to those on the wall, um, constantly over oversimplifying and giving them that language that's part of the key topic vocabulary processing difficulties i will mention and come back to this with assessment because i often feel that a processing problem is is associated and almost they're, they're very um they come together um, as a difficulty with memory. So if a child has low working memory, I'd be very surprised if they also didn't have some kind of a processing difficulty um, that affects them copying um, and affects the speed with which they will process information. And there's only a couple of subtests um, that measure that alongside working memory, but they are part of the intelligence test. So look for that um, when you're observing these children and take account of that when you're delivering information, the speed and the amount and just the, the time that you take to pause and stop and, and let them, the, the, the information digest. Attention that we've talked about, especially when you think how, how easy it is to lose information. I think that there's more and more ch children seem obsessive about certain aspects and that's not to say that it's there are there's so many on the ASD spectrum although there does seem to be much more awareness of that um, many more children are diagnosed but even uh, I would say a lot of adults particularly but but children can be obsessive about particular things their phone being one of them their appearance their peers become increasingly important um, things in their bag in their pencil case things being ordered but they take over they consume them and you can see it happening you can see it right in front of you that something has become important and distracted them and so you need to be keying into what those rituals are and to try and get them to control for those or, or to try and eliminate those in some ways and talk through those with them the sensory needs i can't underestimate um overestimate the importance of this enough does it feel too noisy should we stop and recap or just stop and try and control for that? Does the classroom feel too bright with artificial light? Or is there not enough light? Do we need to put the lights on or the blinds down? I think constantly we should be doing a sensory audit in terms of optimum environment and thinking, how does this classroom feel? How would it feel for learners? And as for you as a teacher, um, are there any textures that are going to be um, distracting for them in the environment, things that they could be touching, objects in the way. Um, so we, we need to be doing that audit and actually it's, it's a really nice activity to, to look at your sensory needs as a teacher and a learner and think how you can get overloaded because that would affect your style, but also consider the sensory needs and of the classroom and how that presents. I think uh, we can't also we can also prioritize a child's self-confidence because if they feel quite low in self-esteem that they're not managing and being successful they will actually be affected in terms of their approach and their recall um, so we have to raise their self-esteem make sure they feel happy they feel buoyant and um, they're ready to learn and so i think there's a lot of work to be done in with confidence around uh, learning and working memory and that needs to be one of those targets that I talked about on the support plan you know how they feel about themselves about themselves as a learner how they feel about the subject what are the barriers to that confidence and how can we increase that so it's quite a holistic way of looking at working memory when you talk about it not just being recall I added social interaction because sometimes it is about the group that they're sitting in um, and the group that they belong to 
um, both socially and academically. And we're very much into groups, aren't we, in, in sort of streaming and ability wise, but they could be very unhappy in terms of where they're sitting and comparing themselves with others. So we do need to consult the children about where they are in the classroom. Um, if they even feel confident at the back of the classroom and, and perhaps a little bit like they don't belong, that they're forgotten, a little bit left out. Do we need to bring them forward? Do we need to sit them at the front? Do we need to change their groups? Do they feel good about where they are? These are all key barriers. Have I left any out? My key phrase here was actually, don't underestimate impact of setting and self-esteem. So I hope that I've actually emphasized the importance of the environment and the sensory needs with that and, and the esteem of the, the learner. Why is it important in the classroom? I don't need to talk through this slide. I feel like you know this, you know why it's become such a huge issue and why it really affects children's success, progress, attention. We think about tasks on a daily basis and all of these that I've mentioned, you know, just reading everything that goes with that in terms of their phonic awareness, um, their word knowledge, um, the decoding of words they don't know, the grammatical structure, it's very, very complicated. Um, and so I've just put a few examples on, on this slide um, that actually just makes you realise how difficult it can be for a child with low working memory difficulties. Okay. What I would say is I've pointed out on my notes here and that I, I don't want to underestimate either is that what you're finding with working memory is that it really is seeping into and affecting directly your reading and your maths. So when you're seeing difficulties with both of those areas, you, you could almost say it is a working memory difficulty without making too many assumptions. And that's when I would be seeking further assessment. But you're seeing that as a very strong indicator. In fact, Stegman and Wright did a study in 2004 and they said that um, working memory was the skills to go with that were excellent predictors of English maths assessment. And that wasn't just at key stage one, that was at key stage three. So it's this golden thread that runs all the way through. So uh, as I can say again, it's about important that you're targeting that in key stage one as much as possible. And this is just a, a food for thought really that I wanted to think about is why we don't know why and um, we're saying it's genetics we're saying it's environment you always have to be holistic and say it, it isn't just one as in genetics it's always nature and nurture and you can't divide those in terms of it being a clearly cut um, percentage or formula um, you have to take account of both um, we do know more about the brain and the, the hemispheres and the functions, the components. Um, but what I would say is that we're seeing that it's got a huge effect on learning and an overload. And so we're having to think about, are we overloading? What can we do to reduce that? How can we change our style, our delivery um, in terms of making this easier? I've referred to it as being a bottleneck but I think you, you know what that phrase means. So I'll move on beyond that. What to look for. I had a, actually a, a profile that I was going to read out. Normally I put in a case study of a couple of children working in that particular school where I've done some working memory training because I always find it, it, at this point you'll think of particular children and you'll hold them in mind. And they're the ones that you drive home with at the end of the day and think they just didn't get it, I lost them again. And what is it about them? Why aren't they remembering? We did this yesterday and I can hear teachers actually saying, I think we've just gone over this actually about 10 minutes ago. And it's hard not to get frustrated um, because you feel that you're repeating yourself and, and why weren't they still with you? But what you will see that are, are trademark signs that I often see when observing at the back of the class or alongside is that this mind wandering or the zoning out, they're looking around. When you're seeing several of children doing that in the classroom, I really do think that's time to stop and to do something else or to go back over or to ask a few questions just to, to be more interactive and change. It is about um, them being very easily distracted, almost fidgety, restless. Um, you'll see them move around more. Um, 
I actually find there's some work avoidance can creep in so that they, they want to go to the toilet, they want to go for something across the classroom, um, they might want to take a water break, but you're seeing some actually quite clever tactics for, for avoiding overload, for avoiding stress. And um, what you'll also see is that there's a huge problem with instructions. The amount of times I've seen on a support plan, they're forgetting the second part of the instruction or parents are saying they're getting to the top of the stairs and you, they can't tell you what you've sent them for. Um, they certainly can tell you the first couple of words, maybe one of the objects, but that's it. Um, and they get frustrated with that because they don't think they're listening. But actually it's just that, yes, you could repeat and repeat, but it's that working memory, they can't hold it in mind. So it's about simplifying the instruction. And what you'll often find is that parents and teachers of special needs children will, will end up really only delivering in single one step instructions. And that's, that's our bread and butter, that's what we do. And then you'll get them to repeat it back because that's another very important strategy because you're getting them to be empowered as part of that process. And you're checking as well and monitoring that, that they've actually um, absorbed the, the key information as part of a single one step. They, they're in a complex task and they've lost track. It could be that they're reading and they've lost place of where they're reading. It could be that they've, um, they're thinking of something to write about. They've got the first sentence down and they've lost the idea for the second sentence or they've lost their place with the flow of the story. Um, they're, they're actually losing the thread of a task so they have to put pens down and stop. And that's where they'll probably be asking for support. And you'll go over to their desk and you'll see two sentences, um, depending on the age level, obviously, and the task, and they just seem to have down tools. And you think, well, why has that happened? You know, that we've gone over the task, they know what to do, we've got the keywords up there, but actually that they've completely lost the thread. And they do, if they're asking for help, it's positive, because they really do want to continue, and they do want to get that momentum back. And you might find that they're talking to others, and some of that time it could be about the task and what to do and get ideas. And you'll find that this might be about children copying others, because they are really stuck as to next steps. Um, sometimes the working memory difficulties can be a, a lot harder to spot and that's why I've put look for the children that seem passive look for the children that are shy and quiet they're not just the non the, the less verbal children the less confident children they're actually the ones that that just you've lost them in terms of the content um, these are the children that sometimes sit at the back of the class they want to be the unnoticed um, they're not putting their hand up because they don't genuinely know um, how to answer the question. And so why are they not contributing? Um, they might be the ones you come to when you do ask them a question, because I know it's good teaching to ask different children questions because you get the same ones answering, but they might be the ones that just can't answer that question. So you need to say, I'm going to give you some thinking time and I'll come back to you. Or you ask the question in a different way. You recap over the information, say, I'll come back. And, and that will really help their confidence and help them to, to achieve because you need to give them these windows of opportunity, these, these sort of spotlights to help them do that. And then of course, you'll see that you've got that very small steps of progress, less progress than you would expect. Um, baseline assessments, obviously showing up um, gaps in their knowledge, inconsistencies um, and um, a, just a delay. And I would say it's becoming, a, it's possibly a generalized delay. You can often hear about saying it's global, but actually probably if you scratch the surface under that global generic term, it is a working memory difficulty and it's, it's showing up in your maths and your reading. Right, I think we'll move on. What are we seeing in terms of learning difficulties? Well, I'll, I'll let you have a look at that, but actually it comes down to your attention, which is your central executive. It's looking at um, what language difficulties because they are very closely linked. So what you'll find is with dyslexia, the verbal difficulties are really impaired. They're, they are really affected. And um, that particularly shows with writing and reading and spelling. Um, and so, you have to be aware that with attention, you've got your ADHD, your ASD, and your, your self-control. Um, with dyslexia, you've got the verbal component that's affected. But 
if you're looking at your conditions, you can almost say that it's the given that there will be some impairment of working memory and some learning style that they're actually they're, they're stronger with and it's about keying into their profile and their strengths and and what the, how they learn best in terms of attacking those working memory difficulties um, because they do have a, a, an extreme focus with certain areas of knowledge so they can retain that knowledge when they're interested and they can become experts actually on certain areas and so it's actually making it meaningful and and keying into their interests and bringing that into the prior knowledge and current knowledge as much as you can. Okay. Now this is an assessment um, section that I wanted to add in because sometimes I don't feel like the assessment aspect is very um, transparent because I come in and do a test in a separate room and then you get to see the results sometimes in a report and other times you, you just get them quoted to you and they mean very little. But with working memory, generally the tests that are used are um, a visual um, assessment, which is looking at the recall of an object, the order of objects. And so they're shown some objects and then they're asked to, re to recall what those were. And then they're increasingly given more objects and asked to recall them in a sequence. Um, but there is also the auditory assessment, which is called digit span. There's three aspects to this. And this is in the cognitive assessment called um, a WISC five which you'll hear about it's a Weschler assessment which is commonly the one that we, we use and for younger children it's a whipsy um, that's reused and especially with cams with the younger children and these two assessments are we add them up together and we give them a score but with auditory going back to that children remembering I'm giving them numbers and they're remembering those numbers it begins with two and then you're adding three four five you'll find that children with working memory difficulty will struggle beyond three or four and so having to remember that and repeat those and then the much harder much more challenging task is digit span backwards where you give them three numbers and they have to say them in the other order and you'll often find they'll miss a, a number out that'll be common um, and they might just remember one or two because that whole process of switching it around has completely thrown them and sometimes they don't even understand what you're asking them to do at first it's it's a really tricky one the sequencing actually is an easier task and you're just giving them you're telling them numbers but you've got to put, get them to put them in order and for some reason they seem to find that um, much more straightforward and they can actually sequence the numbers in order perhaps one or two perhaps maybe three when you're seeing difficulties so those three aspects um, provide your digit span your auditory assessment and then you you couple that and add that together with your scale score for your visual assessment which is a picture span assessment and you're coming up with a, a final scale score for working memory now what is also happening is with assessment is there are being more um, developments with that in that I know Gather Cole's worked on a working memory battery assessment which is actually a computerized assessment and I think that we'll be getting a lot more development in this area of assessment and that teachers will be able to do this in school as well um, it's about 35 minutes but it's a series of tests rather than it just be based on two and the battery of tests then has a, a final score and I, I actually think it would be important to um, use some different assessments in the future, especially as we're getting more information around brain imagery and um, the components of working memory. So watch this space really, um, the automated working memory assessment, that's what it's called. It's, it's three tests, it's computer based, watch out for these and, and they I think will be used much more heavily in school and will be really important as far as um, a profile for a child and some sort of diagnosis and further intervention. Okay, what I would say in terms of percentiles, because you'll hear about the percentile a lot if you're dealing with children with special needs and particularly those children that have got plans, is that if you're talking about um, children with 10th percentile or below, particularly below 5th percentile, so that 95% of children are exactly at their age where they take to take the test at the same time, 
if they're at that fifth percentile or below, they've got significant difficulties with their memory. And the reason I'm, I'm just explaining that is because I, I think it's, it feels like a given that we're supposed to all, always understand that, and particularly parents, we talk to them in these, in these percentiles, which is really quite harsh. But we are talking about this bottom 5% of children um, that are, are really struggling with working memory. And actually, they have to have a whole different approach and differentiated tasks. Everything needs to be different for them because of the level of difficulty they're having. And I assessed a boy today, he's come around the 10th, but if you were to talk to him and meet him, he's, he'd used Machiavellian, the word, in his language class. Um, so you would have had no idea that he presented with a working memory difficulty at 10th. Um, he, he very much presented as a clever, verbal, articulate child who was keen to learn um, and was contributing. Um, I didn't want to fade into the background, although he was quiet, but had a working memory difficulty. So it can be masked, it can be hidden, depending on the confidence and the verbal skills of the children. Um, it's sort of lurking and needs to be investigated in, in a quite a strategic way, I would say. So that's uh, an educational psychologist would do this or a clinical psychologist would do this as part of a CAMS assessment. Um, so please get us in and get us testing these, these memories um, so that we can, we can come up with a, a robust plan and some very good outcomes that address that throughout their primary school rather than let them struggle. Right, I also needed to um, think about memory training. It's an ongoing debate. I actually think just like we'll have more computerized assessment packages, I think we'll, we'll also be developing some much better resources with memory training and the research is, is mixed. We're doing probably going to have much bigger studies out there, but it's inconsistent in some ways in terms of the longevity of the strategies, the effectiveness of, of those. Um, but I still think it has its value in terms of using strategies um, with the children and getting them to be more proactive when they're learning and actually labeling those strategies and, and getting them to be used um, almost like in a, um, with mind maps, with a, um, an, a daily operational task or with your thinking hats you know, with De Bono, but, but just doing that alongside um, the teaching. So what they're saying is there's two approaches. Um, one is about reducing workload and delivery and changing that um, so that you can minimize failure, which I'm coming to. The other one is about going straight to working memory and addressing that in a very strategic way with memory training. There's um, a wider discussion on the link I provided there and, and at the end with references. What I will say is that there, there is evidence that it's leading to improvements. Um, how long-term those improvements are would be, need a much uh, longer-term study, obviously, and a large-scale study, but that there have been short-term improvements and that what they're saying is that children are learning strategies that are still helpful and what's wonderful about this is that those strategies might be applied in other subjects, other contexts and actually take, taken with them for life. And if you think about a very um, capable person with working memory, what they've developed is honed and developed some very good strategies that they apply and rehearse and um, fine tune. So why not teach children these strategies? And if you were to do interventions, that's what the interventions would be about. It would be about games, rehearsal, memory aids. It would be about particular strategies that the child ends up taking on, on board and adopting and become bespoke for them. So the inconsistent evidence, however, is that it's which is the last point. It's not always transferable, that it's taken in isolation um, and it, it can't be used in other contexts and it isn't always long term. I've referred to a journal that I thought you might want to look at um, that is useful and certainly it gives you a wider context. And then I wanted to refer you to a large scale study that was done by Joe Elliott, who's at Durham University. And it shows you that by the end of the year, there was no evidence that actually 
um, I'm just going to move you over here if that's okay, the screen. No evidence to say that it was actually a greater working memory, um, but there were some very good strategies that were learned and helped attainment. So much as I was saying before, it's the, the meat, the bones of the um, improvement in working memory is the actual strategies being used and being able to talk about this. And I think this refers actually to metacognition that you're, you're getting the child to be very mindful about how they learn and what helps them to learn and, and what it's the hooks of what the hooks are that they can pin the information on and which hooks work for them. I'm having to move the box around. Okay. All right, we're going now into support, support for working memory. And this, this until the end of the PowerPoint is basically looking at what helps. So recognize the failures and build a profile. I think this phrase, this first point is about getting to know the child. And remember we talked about what those indicators were. It's really paying attention to those discussing them with the child, other teachers, the parent, and, and to getting a really full profile of what that looks like, because it may not look like the same in, in different lessons. You may find that they're actually much more successful in a more practical type of lesson um, with different subjects. So it, is it happening across the curriculum? Um, if it's better in other subjects, why? What's helping? Um, so what I would say is look for incomplete recall, but which part of the instruction they're not getting, which part of a task are they not managing. So it's breaking down that task to some degree and pinpointing those areas. Um, I would also say that it's recognising which aspects of low memory work, working memory difficulties are challenging for them. Is it mainly instructions? Because that seems to be what, what is noticed most, but it's not necessarily what's happening in the background? Is it that actually when they're reading or there's any kind of comprehension task um, or when they're writing a story, they're, they're losing their place? So again, that's that processing difficulty that is happening here as well. Um, and, and perhaps it's a writing difficulty that they're actually finding it quite hard to write and form their ideas. And so you need to take that into account. Is this around motor skills, for example? Is it around attention? Which part of the component is that the child really struggles with attention? So focus is one of those huge barriers. So I think you need to be very clear as to what those barriers and challenges are and which part they are playing, because it isn't just, well, they just can't remember. So it's looking at the signs, it's discussing with the, with the child, and it's coming up with what they perceive their difficulties are. That's the, the beauty of the position I'm in. I know you get to know your children very well, particularly primary school teachers, but they're not always wanting, or they're reluctant to sort of talk about why they feel that they're failing, what's going well. I always talk about their strengths, but what is the reasoning for their difficulties? And often they will say, I, I lose focus. I I forget. Or actually, I, I, I'm better when I sit at the front. Um, so they talk as well about what helps, but they're recognising that they're distracted and they can refer to that. They're recognising that actually they, they lose their place um, and that um, by the time they've written a sentence, it's taking them so long to write it. It's so difficult in terms of the writing process um, or the copying from the board that they lose track of where they are. So it's unpicking those processes and those other strands that would be responsible and contribute to that. This slide really refers to um, the amount of information that we're giving children in the classroom. Um, and I think the pressure that we're under with curriculum is terrific. Um, and it just seems to become almost excessive in terms of what we expect children to, to know and memorize um, from year to year. And, and we know that that's jumped up and actually that's much more demanding now for, for even a key stage one child. And so actually, how can we strip that back so that we know and ensure that the children are learning 
we can make it more practical, we can make it more kinesthetic, more interesting to them in terms of uh, links to their world and their interests, Pokemon being one of them possibly, um, you know, all the topics that they love and, and are very um, sort of in their lives and, and relevant. What I would say is it's about how much information you're also giving them. So ideally you're, you're not giving an instruction with more than three units in it because those children cannot cannot digest more than three. You're thinking about it being a single in, um, step instruction, particularly at key stage one, um, building up to a, a two step instruction with lots of repetition and lots of visual cues. But can we simplify our instructions? Um, can we deliver them in a different way with less language? We're also thinking about how many sequences we're expecting them to do. Um, and that particularly is apparent with numbers. You know, if we've got a, a maths problem and think about what we're expecting them to achieve and how many steps that would be. And if we could then break that down to the first step and go back to the first step and, and enlarge and, and expand on that. I talked about the meaningfulness, but do we get into their shoes, into their world? Do we um, bring in things that are interesting to them? Um, do we make it very um, fun? Is there lots of role play? Is there things that they can watch and do? Um, so it's about making that come alive, really. And is there um, enough or too much um, unfamiliar information. Well, I would say too much is, is, is very much the case. We're expecting them to not so much recap and link the information to what they know already and to go back over that. We're flooding them with too much information that they don't know. And so actually the really good lessons start with that KWL, what do you know already? Um, and shall we go back over what we know? And that constant recapping, both at the beginning and the whole power of the plenary as well, we can't underestimate that, it is a really important process. It's part of that tying it together for working memory difficulties that's important. So start really with, with the one step back and recap and then go back to that again. And then I would say the grammatical structure. We, we use quite long sentences, I think, in education. We use quite big words. Um, and I think, I certainly think Key Stage 1 teachers are much better at, at keeping the children's attention with simple sentences and the repetition of that. But I think as the children get older, we expect them to be grammatically confident. And, and actually, it's difficult for, I would say, at least 20% of the children in your class, depending on their language development, to, to be as grammatically secure, uh, especially with tenses and um, vocabulary thrown in there. So how do we adjust the demands? And I would say what we're going to be saying, and certainly there was a study done, I'm referring to this by Kane. He said that with low working memory, you're more likely to engage in mind wandering with demanding tasks. And so actually, if you've got that mind wandering, even for three or four children, two, two or three that you might be expecting, um, and, and the restlessness, it's about stopping and adjusting the, the task, the demand, the content. What are some of the strategies we could be doing to reduce that memory load? And I have numbered these steps, but it's not in a particular order um, of importance. So um, I, I'll, I'll let you process that because I do feel I've, I've referred to it already, but I would say it always is about shortening and simplifying and rephrasing. So can you see that every single point refers to taking out the language, taking out the amount of information and making it simpler and making it easier to access or going back to that first step. So it's reduce, reduce, reduce and keeping it very, very simple and repeating. Often I'll have in an EHCP plan at the provision section, I will say um, simplify short, simple instructions, repeated instructions, um, use of visual and practical steps and cues. And that feels like, well, that's quality first teaching. Why should that be down in a plan? But actually it's because you can't, you can't say it's going to happen in every lesson. It doesn't. You can't say that every teacher has the ability to do that in a consistent way. So it's down in black and white that these children need that. I think it's an all children need, to be honest, but I think it's that it's very much those children that are struggling. 
And so actually it might be that you're teaching the class and you then go back to a group of children and you go over most of the instruction in a simpler way and you then write it down for them so they've got it in front of them as a task list and you give them your word bank so they've got the words beside them or you're giving them keywords and you've got that on the board as well. It is good quality first teaching but it feels that much more. Now, um, in terms of, remember I talked about the processing, processing skills earlier, and that is really how much information they can copy, how much they can match, um, and that, if that gets easily overloaded alongside working memory, there are some huge problems. And so actually time is a crucial factor here, not just that there's visual cues, not just that there's repetition, it's that we're allowing enough time. Now they're saying that normally when you ask a question, you should be allowing a five second rule. The reason I've put 10 seconds down is that it's actually, it seems like in an order amount of time, but actually that's the amount of time that some ch children will need and will absolutely use to get that information absorbed and to recall it. So that 10 second rule and I won't count out 10 seconds, but you'll be quite shocked at how long it feels and how stressful it could be that you're stopping and waiting, pausing for that long. And I would say that, that most of us don't use that rule at all when we're asking a question, when we're giving an instruction and expecting a response. And that's because we're operating on our system of processing. We're sort of really forgetting in some ways that we need to let that information filter down and um, be digested. So what helps if you're not giving that additional time? Well, it's the, the repeating of words, just words. I actually think it's repeating of images and it could be symbols because the words are too much. Um, and so the visual cues there. And I think as well, it's getting a partner in there. Could there be another child in your class that you could be using to refresh the children's memory? Could the children be actually turning around to you in the group and saying, um, tell someone else what the instruction is. Can you repeat it to me? So you're actually encouraging them to verbalize the instruction and repeat it back. You're actually getting them to be accountable. Organizational strategies for the classroom and for low working memory. Here it's about what can we do that allows them to refer back to information. You've given it, you, you've, you've taught the information, you've gone over the instruction, you've repeated it, but it's gone, it's not there. So what is it around the environment um, at their desk, on the board that allows them to access it? What I would say is um, colour coding items could be very important in terms of there's a program called Colourful Semantics that allows children to think about the type of word it is, noun, verb, adjective, and where that goes in the sentence. And that has been a very useful, well-researched program that helps children write, basically, because they're thinking about the order and the grammar within a sentence. So Colourful Semantics there is a colour coding type of strategy. Um, what about a checklist? and that the children have to do this, this and this, and as I said, put it on their, their, put it on the board, but also put it on the desk in some cases, give it to certain groups. Do you have a word bank? Is there keywords on the wall? Um, do we have a task that allows to, for the children to draw a diagram? For example, I was in a class the other day and the child was clearly overwhelmed, overloaded with language and had a resistance to writing didn't want to write at all, it had become a huge issue, but could draw a beautifully detailed diagram of the science experiment and label it. And that didn't feel like an onerous task. And so should we do mind maps and more diagrams and more flow charts that actually gets the information across? I think science it lends itself to that, topic lends itself to that, but could we get it more into more of the English heavy literacy based tasks and be using more of those? I think we're really good in key stage one. I just think key stage two in terms of the amount of information the curriculum that we're expected to do, it sort of ends up becoming a bit of a, a, a subsidiary. Um, could we be using more, um, I've mentioned dictaphones, but certainly more apps 
that are interactive and encourage the child to be involved. I mean, Lexia is one of the literacy apps that we refer to, but it's probably successful because it's getting the child to interact with the screen and the content. So it's looking at all the learning apps throughout there and how they could be used. And don't underestimate the power of a, a whiteboard or a notebook and getting the children, certainly as they get older with their writing skills of writing down something or just having a whiteboard that they can scribble some things on. It could be questions, it could be keywords, it could be some visuals, but it certainly helps them to organize their information. And then there's the acronyms. I think I, I grew up with them in history um, and I think more and more we're trying to get children to remember pieces of information with just one letter or rhymes that help them to learn information but they're very very powerful and they're very very helpful then there's the talk about the, the strategies we've talked about with memory training and it's um getting the children to learn these strategies to articulate them to think about which ones work for them and to apply those to particular knowledge rehearsal is just going over and over um, the information and you talk about look, say, cover with spellings um, so that they're saying it again and again. And we think we do that with ourselves. We, we internalize something. If we tell ourselves something on the way out of a, a task or a meeting, must do this, must do this, or we, we write a note. What if the children aren't writing a note? They need to be rehearsing that. Is it that we get them to visualize something that's important to them? Think of an image, um, think of a context. How can we get them to remember that? Chunk sequences of information and group it into smaller parts. I, I do that with telephone numbers. Um, and I think if I was to deliver a memory assessment by chunking it, I think they could actually give me the numbers back. But I have to be careful to say it in the same monotone voice and not have pauses between the numbers because I'm naturally chunking it. So think about how we just stop and OK, how are we going to break that information down into smaller groups? How could we learn that in a different way and, and really um, label and discuss chunking as a, an everyday strategy? And then the colour coding I referred to before. I think I'd be really struck by all of these strategies not being anything new and different. And so I, I really feel in some sense of guilt when I'm going through them, if I'm honest with you, and dissonance because that everything that you, you are doing, we should be doing, that good teachers do. And so don't feel that you're not doing them already. It's just do more of them and make them much more tangible and apparent and discussed with the children. Um, I, I wanted to put in some extra memory games because they're fun and actually they can make things a lot more interesting and a lot more alive. But actually, these were some of the ones that I listed, um, the shopping list game that they write down um, everything they need to remember and then how many they can remember back. Um, how many differences and so looking at two pictures um, of the same topic and what differences can you find because then they've talked about the content and some of the key words that are needed, um, something that needs to be repeated back. The simple game of Chinese whispers. Remember how distorted it gets when you're, when you're repeating it along the line? That can be funny, but actually reminds them that they really do need to listen to key information. But you could go back to the beginning and say, OK, how can we make this different and shorter so it's, it's more easily remembered? You've got Memory Booster, which is some computer games. And I think you've got a lot more apps out there, which would probably be easy to access um, and could be encouraged for use at home as well. Remember I talked about how you've got to prepare the child. You've got to get them empowered. You've got to get them ready for learning and concentrating. And so I think it's about particular children homing in on them and saying, where are you sitting? Um, what's going on around you? How can you look like you're listening, feel like you're listening? And it, it does need to be more of a discussion. It definitely needs to be more of a target so that you're talking about it, reviewing it in a mentoring way and checking in with them. And even just the, the signals, the gestures of you're doing great with this target of just sitting, looking and listening. Um, putting your hand up, getting them to be more involved with answering questions. My son gets very restless. I'll say to him, answer more questions. The teacher will know you're listening by just doing that rather than fading into the distance. Um, a visual timer could be important. You know, you've got this long for this task. So let's really home in on in it. And I'll say short tasks of five minutes, give them a timer. It makes them more accountable. You don't want to stress them out, but would that help with the task on hand? 
And then you've got to think about the allocation where they're sitting and the group that they're sitting with. I talked about that, the sensory needs, but could we teach them more self-help skills that actually help them to remember, to, to focus um, and, and make them actually be in control of those? It's reducing the learned helplessness. I have put a really useful video in here um, of a lady, Alloway, that's actually done a lot of research into autism. And she came up with three steps as part of the video, if you're to watch it, of just these are the key things that we really need to get these children to do, given all of their um, difficulties with sensory needs, um, with rigidity, with obsession and um, obviously with working memory difficulties in some cases. One step at a time, minimise over stimulation and have routines because it's those routines that are really comforting to them in terms of learning and remembering and tasks. And this would be around thinking about your environment. Step back into your classroom tomorrow or, or you know, at the end of the week when you've got a chance to think, get some colleagues in, just have a look in terms of a working memory perspective at everything around on the walls and, and what you're, you're learning. Is there enough interactive display? Is there enough lists? Is there some alternative ways of recording in there? So you're not always expecting them to write, you're expecting them to use the computer, you're expecting them um, to draw, you, you're doing some different ways every day that, that gives some variety and takes the pressure off but you're also giving them enough information around in the environment and enough different ways of teaching and learning that makes it interesting and alive. So, as a summary, are we monitoring how much, um, how much that presents and how it presents with the child? Do we have enough of a, pro a, a, a procedure, a protocol and a profile for the child? Do we have a, a clear picture of how that child's struggling and what that looks like? Are we reducing the demands enough with our instructions, with the content? Are we repeating and using enough memory aids to help the information be digest, digested and processed? Are we giving them a, enough um, aid and support to help them process? And are we teaching the strategies? Remember I said earlier, I talked about outcomes and I thought these were really useful questions because often I'm sitting down and writing these outcomes, both for a child with a plan or with teachers with consultation. What do you want them to change? Don't just say you want them to remember a multi-step instruction. What is it? What would it look like that change? What would they be doing more of? How could we get them to persist and approach tasks differently? Um, what are their strengths? How are we using their strengths and their interests to help them learn and remember? Um, because what are they good at? Perhaps with visual, um, perhaps with drawing, um, perhaps they need more interactive. They're really good with ICT. Could they be using more ICT to remember with learning apps and um, with recording? And how, what would that progress look like? We need teacher assessment, but we need certain pieces of work that would show um, certain observations that would show and measure that progress. So that's just as important as, as uh, the final outcome. And not to leave these out, but we really should be doing this as part of the teaching and learning and thinking about all the different styles and um, the opportunities that we have with teaching. And I've also referred to that. I felt it was really powerful to refer back to the activity-based learning because 90% of what we remember and learn is what we say and do. We really should be active, interactive, um, because it's meaningful and it sticks. I've, I've added some frequently asked questions, having read quite a bit of research. I thought those might be useful for you to think about and take away with if you couldn't come up with some now because it's putting you on the spot. But there could be some questions about stress, there could be about um, whether it, how it persists, it could be, does it decline? You know, these are some of the questions that you might be thinking about, what really affects memory? And I think everything affects memory, but actually stress can affect memory. And so if you've got a stressed child or some trauma in many cases, it will affect memory. So I will answer all of these questions and more, but just wanted you to take a look at those and see if there was any that were very pertinent to you or that some hadn't been addressed. Okay, that's it. That's, that's my 
presentation. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry that I've lost a few of you on the way, but I'm hoping that the ones that are left um, have, have got some questions for me. And thanks for listening, of course. Thank you very much, Denise. Thank you. Um, it's always so difficult, isn't it, to stay to to stay within an hour um, for for these topics when there's so much to to be um, to be sharing with people, both for those underpinning principles and the theory as well as the strategies. Um, so really, really, really useful. I'm not sure, Francesca, whether we have time for, for just any questions. the time. I've gone completely over. So I sorry. About that's that. okay. There were a couple of questions that popped up in the chat. And when people get the slides tomorrow, if we share those with you, Denise, yeah. um, the questions that came up, and if people do have any follow-on questions, okay. then um, if, if we can kindly ask you to, to give us your reflections on those and we could email them out to colleagues um, after the slides if that's okay. okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you all very, very, very much. Um, and thank you to Denise. Thank you. See you later.